Major Lindsay and Africa presents Bouncing Back, conversations about resilience for lawyers. Welcome to Bouncing Back, Resilience for Lawyers. This podcast is brought to you by Major Lindsay and Africa, the global leader in legal search and legal consulting. I'm your host, Rebecca Glasser, and I am a managing director in the associate practice group at Major Lindsay in Africa. In this podcast series, you'll hear me speak to successful professionals about the hiccups, bumps, bruises, and setbacks they've experienced in their careers and personal lives, and how ultimately they bounce back from those experiences to flourish. Today, my guest is Jason Carter. Jason is currently a law partner at Bondurant, Nixon, and Elmore, one of Atlanta's most respected law firms, where he represents clients in high stakes trial and appellate business litigation. From 2010 to 2015, Jason served in the Georgia State Senate, and he was the 2014 Democratic nominee for governor of Georgia. Jason has been named to Georgia Trends list of 100 most influential Georgians, and has consistently been recognized as a super lawyer in Atlanta Magazine. Jason has received numerous other awards for his legal work and community service, including the Anti-Defamation League's Stuart Eisenstadt Award for his work defending voting rights. Jason currently chairs the Carter Center's Board of Trustees. The Carter Center is a non-governmental, non-for-profit organization founded in 1982 by former U.S. President Jimmy Carter to prevent and resolve worldwide conflicts, enhance freedom and democracy, and improve health around the world. So Jason, let's get into it. In 2014, you were the Democratic nominee for governor of Georgia. You ran against uh, Republican incumbent Governor uh, Nathan Deal at the time, and you ultimately lost your bid for governor, receiving 44.9% of the vote. Tell me a little bit about that experience. Well, thank you so much for having me, uh, Rebecca, number one. And number two, you know, one of the things that that led me into that um, experience and into politics in general is, um, you know, sort of some difficulties that I was having trying to balance the um, the practice of law with all the other things in my life. You know, I, I had a real desire um, to to be a lawyer and to be successful, um, but I also knew that that wasn't the only thing in my life. I had small children at the time. I had desires to go out and, and make an impact in the community, and I was trying to find a way uh, to be successful in multiple different things at the same time, including being a father. Um, and it was just hard, and and it's and I think a lot of people struggle with that. Um, and so in that moment, I, I realized for me that moment, sort of in the history of Georgia and, and in my life, um, that I needed to devote myself really fully um, to something. And and I had been in the state senate, um, and and that was a, a time when we were excited. We were some, a little bit early in terms of Georgia um, really becoming a, a battleground state um, from a politics standpoint, but. I got in it because I thought I could make a difference for people. There were 670,000 people that did not have health insurance um, because of a political decision that our governor made to uh, not expand Medicaid. So the people of Georgia were paying um, to give health insurance to these 600,000 people, and then we were sending the money back to Washington without doing that. So I felt compelled to get engaged. But, uh, you know, for as it may be interesting to your listeners, it, it, it grew in part out of, you know, some real struggles in, in, in balancing my life as a lawyer. That makes complete sense. You know, I guess the sort of idea of let's do one thing and try to do it really well <laughs> versus uh, <laughs> a bunch of different things and maybe some better than others. I assume you had the support of your wife and uh, the rest of your family when you when you went into this. Was there any pushback um, from, you know, whether that be wife or your dad or your grandfather or or was everybody kind of gung-ho about this um i think everybody was gung-ho about it uh certainly at the beginning it's a grueling process you know anyone who's ever run for office in a statewide campaign and we had a lot of national attention and we you know had to had to raise millions and tens millions of dollars um to do it and and so and and it just takes a hundred percent of your time and um, in that way, it, it, you know, by the end of the time, I think uh, certainly my family was ready for the process to be over um, for sure because of how grueling it is. But, no, it was a lot of support. And, you know, not only from my family, but from my law practice, from my the partners at my law firm, from the other lawyers that I had worked with over the years. I mean, in that way, 
um, running for office was a, a great example of sort of feeling support from so many different people, um, you know, who really invested in my campaign. And, and you know, now you, you feel like over the last five or six years, I've just been trying to, to pay that back and you realize there's no possible way uh, you can ever repay all of the, the outpouring that you received. But in that way, it was, I felt very supported. Um, of course, uh, it was unsuccessful and, and uh, you know, we, we didn't, we weren't able uh, to, to sort of succeed there. So in one, in one way, I guess the last job I tried to get, uh, I failed. Um, but it, it has had a great impact on my my life and as a personal experience and, and frankly, as a, as a lawyer. Well, I was going to ask you about that, you know, in the sense that I remember at the time attending some fundraisers on, on your behalf and, um, you know, the, the sort of buzz of, you know, this is, if, if anyone's going to be able to flip Georgia, so to speak, this is the sort of drumbeat, right, of friends and mm -hmm. people in the know, you know. Former President right. Jimmy Carter's son is going to do it right because there's name recognition and you had been in the state legislature for so long and you're sort of a known entity. Um, and so hopes were high. And so I'm curious about how you process the loss, y you personally and the folks around you. Well, so, you know, we knew it was an uphill battle um, and obviously it's sort of on some level a high profile failure. Um, but on another level, you know, we know we really started. Um, this 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 effort to really build an infrastructure in Georgia to really transform Georgia, both from a dialogue standpoint. I mean, one of the things that I can look back on that race on and know is that is that the governor focused on the issues that we wanted to focus on. We focused on on healthcare, focused on education, and, and we were able to advance the public dialogue. So you can find sort of good aspects of uh, you know good things to show for this this failure. Um, but also, you know, on a personal level, um, you know, I didn't have regrets about it. I felt like I did everything that I could, and, and that was really helpful. Um, you know, there's there's pluses and minuses to being recognized everywhere. You know, once once you know in that race, you know, we spent ten million dollars saying good things about me, and the other side spent almost twice that saying bad things about me. So everybody right. uh, at least <laughs> knew who I was, <laughs> which is you know bad and good. Right. Indeed. Indeed. Um, so related to that, I mean, you had a series of experiences prior, prior to this gubernatorial race that I'm sure right. you feel kind of set you up to, to kind of be in good stead, win or lose. You know, it sounds like you came into it kind of with the right attitude. <laughs> um, you know, this is either going to go well or it's gonna be great. And if it doesn't, you know, I will go back to you. Uh, my law practice and a myriad of other things, including a, being a good husband and, and father. Um, so you had a lot of things sort of in the background. It's not like all your eggs were in, in one basket, so to speak. Um, right. And I'm curious, you know, what experiences in your life um, prior to sort of set you up for being okay with running in such a high profile race having national, perhaps international eyes on you, you know, that's not something, that's a hot box that not, not all of us are sort of prepared to, to, to be in. Um, and I'm curious about, you know, upon reflection, what you think sort of set you up for success in um, being in that space and, and sort of being okay, whether it went your way or not. Um, you know, that, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a hard question. Cause on some level, it's, you, I kind of want to say, well, everything, you know, I mean, I, you know, I am who I am because of this sort of large number of experiences that I have had, but the way that I approached it is I knew what was the most important to me. Um, and, you know, and I, I literally woke up every morning when I was running for governor and I thought, well, you know, today is going to be really annoying for these 20 reasons, um, and I have a lot to do, and it's going to be exhausting, but there's 670,000 people that will get health insurance if I win. Um, and I knew that that endeavor was worth it, um, and I knew that I, that I felt like myself in the right place. Like, I knew that I was spending my time on something that was compelling to me, uh, and it was easy to wake up and do that. And, and you know, b because of that, and because I knew that I sort of did everything I could, um, I always knew I might not win, um, but I, I was doing my best to do it. And so, you know, you got to be willing to fail or else you'll never try to do anything great. 
Yeah. And my family yeah. has done a lot of that, right? I mean, Jimmy Carter lost a big, huge presidential race. Um, and what he's done since then, at least in a lot of people's eyes, certainly enough people's eyes, and certainly in his own, I think, view of himself, has been uh, incredibly successful, you know? And so I think that's, you know, the examples of having setbacks not be, not be true failures is abound. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You've got some impressive folks in your in your family, uh, not the least of which is your grandfather. Um, <laughs> I, I was going to ask, you know, speaking of family um, and in reflecting on, again, the gubernatorial experience specifically, um, you have two young sons. Uh, and they're getting older by the minute. <laughs> I keep looking at photos. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I can't believe how old they are right now. Question about, you know, what lessons would you take from the gubernatorial race specifically in that entire experience that you would share with your sons, um, you know, going forward? Uh, if they would listen, you know, that's a whole nother thing. But, you know, if you were to think <laughs> through, what takeaways could I share with these guys that would be useful life lessons uh, for them? Well, I, I honestly think, I mean, you know, it, it is, it's like uh, some people will always look at it as a, uh, a big public failure. I mean, and, yeah. and you know, and, and they're, they will think that, but I don't think anybody in my family looks at it like that. And my kids know why we did it. They know why it was worth it uh, to give it a try. Um, and I, and they've also seen, you know, me sort of, you know, continue on. And, and I think sort of my, standing in, in our community and my standing in the legal practice and my standing in the in the world uh, was heightened because of that race um, in a host of ways. And, and you know, it, it, the point is, I think, you know, is, is you try to make sure that you're not doing it only for yourself. And if you are doing it for other people and you're doing it for sort of, quote, the right reasons, um, it's worth it to try big things. And I think, yes. you know, a lot of the that fear of failure is one thing that motivates people, but sometimes it keeps people out of the arena and you don't ever want to have your fear of failure be so great that it becomes the fear of trying. Yeah, definitely. No, I think, I think those are, those are great lessons doing it for the right reasons, whatever it is that you may be, whatever endeavors you may be engaging in, um, you know, and, and if you're doing it for the right reason, sort of knowing, okay, win or loss, fail or succeed, I tried, um, I got in the ring, and, you know, I'm going to learn something from, from this experience. Uh, that's the essence of resilience, um, you know, in short. Um, you touched a little <laughs> bit about your, on your grandfather, um, and I know that his mom was, was something else, as, as we say down here. <laughs> um, uh, also a resilient, pretty impressive um, woman. You know, I'm interested, uh, if, one, if you knew her when she was still alive and, and if you had, you know, kind of the nature of that relationship and if there were um, lessons from her specifically. Uh, for the listening audience, um, Jason's great-grandmother Lillian uh, entered the Peace Corps when she was 68 um, and spent a good bit of time after that in India, um, you know, doing various things. Uh, she was a nurse by training. And, I mean, that's just one example of a myriad of things that she did in her life that were incredibly um, impressive. She, I have a thing for feisty Southern women, Jason, since I consider myself <laughs> one. So, um, reading about her has been quite inspirational. I'm curious about um, the impact that she may have had, um, you know, on your, on your life view um, and anybody else in your family that you think kind of set you up for success um, in, in your political endeavors and your legal endeavors and everything else? Look, I, I think grandmama, we called her grandmama, right? Miss Lily, grandmama. Was, everybody knew her, we, grandmama. But grandmama would, would uh, you know, number one, I did know her. Uh, and, and she passed away when I was eight or nine. But she definitely was the first person I ever heard use a bunch of words that I wasn't allowed to use. Uh, <laughs> and she's very feisty, fi very, very feisty very, very in that way. But yeah, she turned 70 in the Peace Corps. I mean, and I think that experience infected my whole family. I mean, she was a little old lady from South Georgia, um, you know, who had lived in a town of 600 people. And she left and went to India for two and a half years almost at a time when, you know, she was writing letters home in the 60s. It's not like now where you, you know, you go to the Peace Corps, which I did when I was in 
when I was in the Peace Corps, and I'll talk about that in a second. But, you know, the difference between when I went in the late 90s and when she went is she didn't have any real communication. It's not like she was on the Internet keeping up with the Braves games. You know what I mean? It's like she was exactly. isolated. <laughs> yes, and pre-internet. So that, that, pre-internet, pre, pre-everything just about, right? I mean, she's – but anyway, you know, her experience, I think, infected my whole family with this idea that, you know, you can go anywhere and help people uh, and that it matters to help people all the way around the world. And, and part of that sort of resilience is when my grandfather left, you know, was involuntarily retired from the White House. She was standing there. He was in his 50s. And she said, well, I turned 70 in the Peace Corps. What are you going to do? And I think yeah. that really <laughs> motivated him to do all the stuff. Yes, yes. Because, you know, people, you know, uh, President Clinton, President Obama kind of hold up your grandfather as, you know, this is what post-presidency should look like, right? You know, you're you're not done. You don't just go retire away somewhere and keep all your thoughts and your value to yourself. Um, and it's, it's cool to hear that your great-grandma may have had something to do with that. <laughs> um, uh, I, I love it. I, I think that's great. Um, you mentioned your own time in the Peace Corps. Um, you know, tell me a little bit about that and, you know, kind of the takeaway uh, from, from that experience. Well, she, she certainly, I mean, you know, Grandma clearly inspired my family to believe in, that that would be a good idea, right? And I graduated from Duke. And I had, uh, you know, a lot of options of what I wanted to do. But, but uh, you know, the, my grandfather and others were basically just like, look, go to the Peace Corps and figure out who you are. And the great thing about the Peace Corps, I was in South Africa when Mandela was the president. So it was an am- amazing moment in history to be there, um, you know, just at the end of apartheid. Um, we were working in schools, and I was the first only white person for 30 miles um, where I lived. And I, you know had these incredible experiences. My Zulu is great. It's like my best party trick. Um, but the uh, but the real experience was about the people who live in these communities and don't have any of the resources that we have or the material yeah. stuff that we have who still just drive so much change and so much improvement in their communities that it's unbelievable. And to me, the, the understanding and the, the sort of the, that people are pretty much the same everywhere that they all want, you know, a better life for their kids, and and to make sure that their that, that their communities are 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 good and, and have what they deserve. It's super inspiring, and certainly the people that I met in the Peace Corps are as inspiring to me as my grandfather who won the Nobel Peace Prize. You know. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I would imagine. Um, you know, sort of reflecting on that experience and reading some of your book. I haven't made it all the way through, full confession, but, um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it had to be sort of eye-opening, right? Because, you know, you go from, you know, playing in the Rose Garden at <laughs> Grandpa's house, <laughs> um, you know, going right. to you know, that experience, uh, having um, you know, let's Duke uh, is a kind of heralded place, you know, a private school, very fancy pants, if you will, um, you know, going into certain circles. But at the same time, it sounds like there's this element of um, grounding that was also kind of, um, I don't want to say beat into you, a theme, <laughs> a theme of your yeah. life. Uh, right. Um, and, and, and I would imagine that probably influenced kind of, the you know, again, the way you, you view things and then you go to South Africa um, and to your point, may, maybe, maybe there was internet there. Did, was that the beginnings of, you know, did you have internet access? I'll have to tell you that just like, I want to talk about grounding and all these bigger topics too, but I will say, yeah, we had internet, but I had to take my computer to this like little dirt hut that had the one phone line and I would plug it in and I would dial up and then I would upload all my emails and download all my other emails and then I would go back like eight miles to my house. So I had ad- yeah. internet okay. access, but it was like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not in the form that we are used to, right? Not in the form that we uh, rich Americans who live in 2020 uh, are used to <laughs> indeed. Um, and, and, but and yeah, frankly, yeah. Frankly, in the village where I live, everybody's got a, a smartphone. I mean, so it's a, the world is different everywhere. You know, even in Liberia, some of the poorest places in the world, you know, people are on Facebook getting their news. Uh, and so it's a, 
the world is different, but from a grounded standpoint, as we, as you were saying before, you know, I, I think, I think one of the things about my family and certainly my grandparents is, you know, they came from this tiny town of 600 people and, you know, went on to do all these incredible things, but they never thought they were better than anybody. They never thought that if you weren't, you know, educated, that you didn't have a chance to do something, or they never thought that if you didn't belong to some club or if you did, that it made a difference. And I just, that was really important for us forever. And that sort of anti-elite <laughs> idea probably got him in trouble in Washington, but uh, it certainly helped to your point be, be grounded. And I, I've had a lot of other experiences that have grounded me, including, you know, the losses that we've already talked about. Yeah. What, what else, you know, when you think of an instance of <laughs> grounding, we'll call it yeah. humbling yeah. grounding, um, you know, anything that sort of just popped you know what what are maybe the top yep. one or two experiences that that made you go I'll, ah yeah reminder I'll, i I'll i put my pants on like everybody else <laughs> i'll tell you right now i was walking i it was my first day back at my law office after running for governor um and again i had lost but i had had a lot of people support me um and gotten millions of votes and, and done a bunch of other things and, and so certainly within like my, my building i work in a big you know used to when i went to work uh, Pre-COVID, I worked in a you know 50-story office building in Atlanta, and I got in the elevator, and like a couple people from a big law firm in town were like, "Oh, hey, Jason, I voted for you." Blah blah blah. I was feeling important. I walked down the street, you know, senior partners from another big law firm in Atlanta I said, "Jason, oh, hey, looks great." Blah blah blah. I said, "Oh, thanks," and I was really feeling important, and I was getting ready to walk into this uh, restaurant, and I was just like, "Man, I wonder how many people looking at these windows of this restaurant." wonder how many people sit in there recognize me. Like I'm feeling like a big important guy. And I hit this step, I had my hands in my pockets and I fell literally flat on my face and like <laughs> scraped my arm real bad and like sort of stumbled and thought, well, there's the universe talking to me. And, I, and my first thought was, God, I hope none of these people recognize me. Um, so I walked in and went to the bathroom and cleaned the blood off of me and had my lunch. But anyway, it, you know, there's things like that that happen all the time. I mean, and no matter who you think you are, how important you think you are, to your point, most people don't yes. care. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It sort of reminds me of, uh, um, you know, kids too. They will humble you. Uh, they don't really. Oh, they yeah. want their own mad And uh, I'm sure your sons are like, Daddy. They, they're not interested in candidate Carter or lawyer Carter. They're interested in Daddy and making sure that you feed them and take care of their needs and give them attention and love. So um, that can be well, humbling as well. Look, spouses will keep you grounded. Uh, at least mine does. <laughs> Amen. Amen to that. <laughs> I I agree with you as, on that one as well from my own personal experience. Jason, given that we have a last few minutes here, um, you know, what advice would you give to junior associates who are experiencing setbacks in their careers and personal lives for the first time? Um, perhaps they were too junior, too young everybody has gone through something like that in their life. And if they haven't, they haven't really lived. But I also have to say that every time I was ever going through a tough time and someone told me, oh, you'll be better for it. I always thought, you know, screw you. This is hard. Right. And I never really appreciated <laughs> anybody's advice at those times. And so I, I just think that, it, you know, hindsight, you know, knowing that you're going to get through it and that there is something on the other side, um, is the most important thing. And, you know, for, for me, uh, you know, and the type of struggles that, that we all go through and that we've all had, um, you know, it, it does, it is in fact, the kind of thing that makes you a human being. Everybody goes through it. And frankly, the, you know, the thing that, that I have learned is I've seen a lot of people who look like they've never had a failure. A lot of people who are super successful lawyers, who have, you know, made a ton of money, who've done everything, and they hate their lives. And, you know, that's way more sad to me and way more of a failure than somebody who's struggling to get ahead and is, and is finding it difficult. Because that person, at least, is being true to who they are, trying to figure out what it is that they want to be, how they can plug in to the world. And, and, and that's going to be better than somebody even who's become a super successful lawyer and still hates their life because that person has nowhere to turn. Right, right. Amen. Um, and life's short, isn't it? Uh, and, and to be happy and to have tried um, is, is certainly a life worth living, you know, versus someone who keeps it yeah. safe and is, and is miserable. I, 
uh, as a legal recruiter, I, I talk to a lot of those unhappy people on a regular basis. I, I completely understand uh, what you mean. I, I think that's great. You know, being true to yourself, uh, recognizing that you have to take risks to actually get anything worth having in life. Um, that's really, really good advice. Um, any last words you'd like to share with our listening audience before we wrap things up? Well, I mean, just stick with it. I mean, you know, one of the things that I think is, is, you know, the people that you have around you that respect you and are there for you, um, you know, that's the real sign of success is who are you surrounding yourself with and who is it that you're relying on? And uh, to me, you know, realizing sort of the depth of support that I've had from a lot of different places, um, it's, it's incredibly valuable. And, you know, the best thing I've ever done and probably haven't done it enough is, you know, the, the people that are younger than me who are aspiring lawyers who are interested or, or, or aspiring politicians or both, you know, my ability to, to help them and to spend some time with them, um, you know, seek out mentors and seek out those supporters and, and that'll eventually turn into, uh, you know, the kind of law practice that you want, the kind of life that you want. I mean, those human connections are everything. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you again for your time. Thank you for listening to Bouncing Back, Resilience for Lawyers. Join us next time for another story about thriving after overcoming challenges. You can find Bouncing Back and other programming for lawyers on MLA's Legal Talk Network.